what I'm going to do next is I'm going to open up the, the, the hood and uh, take a look um, at how things work really underneath. Um, that includes a couple of teasers to additional features that I won't be showing you today, um, but you'll still learn a couple of data like commands in passing. But it will be mostly about yeah, explaining how the version control tools work that, that we are dealing with. Now, um, the question that you might have asked yourself is why are there two version control tools at work? And the reason is that one is not enough when we're handling large files. Um, Git is the industry standard and science standard for version controlling stuff, but it does not handle large files well. To um, give you a simplified overview of what Git uh, does underneath the hood to version control files is it creates snapshots of your Git repository of your data lake data set. So each of these version one, version two, version three is one point in time in your Git repository where you ran, for example, Git commit or data let's save. And what Git does is creating snapshots of the files and their changes. Um, and uh, whenever a file change, for example, file A, um, file A to file A1, this uh, difference will be included in the snapshot. And when a file does not change, for example, file B isn't changed in version two and still file B, then it's just a pointer to the previous version of the file. Um, and it's not, um, not snapshotted. And those snapshots, they um, contain the changes that uh, happened in between file versions, if possible, in a really um, efficient and storage saving um, way. Because Git is made to handle um, text files well, Git has really efficient strategies to internally represent any differences that occur between um, different versions uh, of uh, text files like code, like software, uh, and so forth. So what that means is that um, over time, with every little commit, the snapshots in your Git repositories grow a little bit, not by much. Like if you do it in a standard Git repository just with text files, everything is small because it's a text file and Git handles text files really well and has efficient storage strategies to store the deltas to store the to store the differences um, between versions. The problem happens whenever you start to include files that are um, either not text files, like binary files, for example, brain images, e.g. data, whatever kind of files or data you're acquiring in your research, um, and or when these files are really large. Uh, it's worse when they're both binary and large. So what happens with Git's snapshot system, if you were to include a five gigabyte brain image into your revision history, is for one, the first snapshot where this file is included is already five gigabytes large. That's a lot. Um, but also because the brain image isn't a text file, whenever you change this brain image, and that could be a really minor change, it could be just a um, change in the header information. Uh, or something, then Git does not have a strategy to represent this change efficiently. And what it does is it needs to store the complete file in a new snapshot. So your um, snapshots have grown by five gigabytes with this um, new uh, um, change. Um, that per se will not bring Git to its knees. If you do this really often with a lot of files, with hundreds of, of files, um, with like, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 gigabytes, Git will still work fine. After a while, it will get sluggish and you are able to kill your Git repository if you add too much data to it, but it's, it's not the worst. What makes it inconvenient is that um, your repository grows. Uh, specifically, the snapshots are stored in this hidden .git directory. And whenever you share your data set with any other person, what they need to retrieve, for example, with a download, is the complete uh, snapshot history, the complete revision history. You, they want to have all of the revision history. They want to be able to see everything. And when they want to obtain that uh, in a data set that con uh, in a Git repository that includes lots of large files, it will take a lot of time. If you 
where to version control 50 gigabytes of data in a Git repository, which is not a good idea. You could do this, but it's not a good idea. Then anyone you share your data set with needs to download 50 gigabytes of data. And that's super slow. And it will make a lot of operations in this Git repository incredibly sluggish. And if you were to push this further, more files, more data, you will eventually become or get to a stage where your Git repository is broken. Um, the next reason why this is really not a good idea is that the repository hosting services that you may want to use in order to expose your work or share your work or collaborate with others, they have a problem with large files. Um, if you ever accidentally committed a too large file into your Git repository and then you want to send it up to GitHub, you will see a message like that. GitHub, a Git repository hosting service, has an internal limit in file size. So Git doesn't have it. Uh, at least it doesn't enforce it. Uh, it just has sensible defaults. But GitHub has a strict limit. And when your um, files exceed this limit, you will not be able to push any changes to GitHub. And that's an incredibly inconvenient problem because when you revert a commit, you actually don't get that large data out of your revision history. It's quite a difficult endeavor to, um, to completely get rid of, of files that you have committed into your Git history with Git um, that I wouldn't recommend um, you to be in a position to, to, to do this. Um, so that's quite, quite sad. And that's the reason why uh, we use Git Annex. And Git Annex is the tool that enables us to version control large files alongside a lot of small files uh, using Git, but uh, essentially without putting the large files contents into Git's snapshots and thus making sure that our Git repository stays performant and that operations that are done to share this Git repository are super fast and lean. Uh, and um, to demonstrate how it works, I'm going to quickly show you how you clone data sets, so how you can obtain uh, other people's data sets. And that is done with a data let clone command. This data let co clone command can point to a local path, but it can also point to a GitHub URL. For example, you can go to GitHub and clone a data set that contains all of the data from the human connectome project. So if you ever want to use that data, then you can get it as a data let data set. Um, and here's how that looks like just in, uh, in motion. Here's a Git repository. You can get its URL, and then you can take that URL and put it into a data let clone command. This cloning, you can also do it with a Git clone, by the way, is uh, really fast, even though this uh, study here is a neuroimaging study with uh, dozens of gigabytes of files. Uh, and if you take a look into this data set after you have installed it, that's what we call it, you can see that it contains all of these neuroimaging files that you would typically expect in, uh, for example, a bit-structured stru bit neuroimaging data set. Now, importantly, it was really fast, and the contents of these uh, files um, need to be retrieved in order to actually trigger the download that obtains you the data that they track. And a data let get command on any of those files or any directory or the complete data set will trigger the download that is necessary to actually obtain the, um, the, the uh, version controlled large files um, content. That's a little bit counterintuitive and not what you expect when you're used to cloning Git repositories, because when you clone a Git repository, you know, you can see the contents of files. With um, data led data sets, this is not always the case. So the data set that you clone is very, very lean. It's very fast to install. And there is something that you can simplify as metadata, which is file names, nothing more than file names and an internal record of where they are available from, but not the file content that actually belongs to those files. So if this data set that I've just um, cloned, if I were to look at how much space does it take up on my system, it's just a fraction of uh, the actual file contents that are tracked with it, just 18 megabytes instead of, I'm not sure, 60 gigabytes or something. 
But any file content that I need, I can retrieve on demand using a command that is called data let get. Um, and I can point that to files, I can point that to directories, I can point that to complete data sets. The immediate advantage that this has, uh, just independent of any um, functionality of version control tools here, uh, is that you can have access to more data on your computer than you have disk space. So for example, if I were to clone the ENKI dataset from our internal data management server, then on my disk, it's uh, 1.5 gigabyte. Uh, but the complete data set is more than 1.5 terabyte that I have actionable access to. Uh, if I were to clone the HP, HCP data set, um, it's a really large data set. It would actually take up like 50 gigabytes because it's um, I way more than 50 million files, but that would give me actionable access to 200 terabytes of file content um, without having to store them locally, which is really quite neat. And what is more, whenever I have retrieved a file content using data like get, I can drop it again in case I don't need it anymore. So what I've gotten from somewhere, I don't actually need to know where, can um, be dropped to, to free the disk space that has been used up by that content. And when I do this, the file name, this metadata, this file availability metadata stays behind and I can reobtain it using get whenever I need it. Uh, that's um, especially neat for, um, for example, data analysis, where I can just include a data led command at the end and at the start of my script that ensures that the relevant data is obtained and then dropped once I have done my analysis. Uh, and this is also something, or this is also one way it was done in this um, reproducible paper preview that I've shown you. The analysis itself takes care that the data it needs is actually there. And the reason for this weird behavior, for this um, file content that is just available on demand and comes as metadata file names when you're cloning a dataset, that's because this file content is stored in Git Annex instead of Git. So your dataset has contents that are either stored in one of the two tools, either Git or Git Annex. And if you just create a dataset without any configuration, then everything in your dataset uh, will actually be annexed, that's the default. And the reason for this is that um, those two tools, they um, provide different advantages for different files. And Git Annex is a tool that can handle every single type of file uh, well. It doesn't matter what type, binary text file, what, what size, small, large, um, what, what privacy concerns are, but the file Git Annex handles all of them. That's why that's a default. Git handles small files well though. So any text or any code can very well go into Git. It's actually useful. Um, but uh, core differences between Git and Git Annex are that the file contents that you put into Git are actually in the Git history. So if you were to browse the Git history, then you can see all of the files changes like we did in the readme in this revision log. And this is not the case uh, for Annex content. Content, contents and I will show you I will show you how that looks in a minute. Anything that's kept in Git is also stuff that's immediately available right after a clone and it is shared with every single dataset clone. So if you have file contents that um, have some like special sensitive data, participant information and stuff like that, uh, passwords in case you were to store them in text files or something like that, then um, you can give them to Git Annex and that ensures that you can uh, keep those files private on a per, per file level and not exposing the contents of those files to the revision history, which can be, depending on field of study, a really useful thing. So um, as, a, as, a, as a like rule of thumb, it's useful to keep small um, text files in Git, especially those that you frequently modify, readme files, data usage agreements, and so forth. But large files or private files should be stored um, in Git Annex. Um, there are two important considerations when you make the case-by-case -case decision on which files should go into Git Annex and which files should go into Git because there is a difference in how these files or how interacting with this file with these files feels. Anything that you put into Git 
is modifiable right away, like the readme file, like the metadata files, the YAML files that we created. Anything that is put in Git Annex will be write protected. Uh, and I'm going to show you how that looks uh, soon. But um, the, uh, the um, JPEGs that we included in the data set, they are, for example, actually annexed. And I would have a hard time if I were to just simply try to modify those files because the version control tool is working in the background to ensure the integrity um, of this file. I'll show you how to work around this uh, soon too. And then uh, you can put, uh, you, need to, you need to remember that annexed files are not available right after cloning, only stuff that is available or kept in Git is available right after cloning. So if there's something that you really easily want to share, then um, consider putting it into Git if possible and not into the annex. So a readme file is probably not cool to be annexed because then they need to retrieve the contents, uh, but the readme file maybe contains the explanations on how to actually run the data that you've compiled. So uh, those are just two, two, two considerations to, to keep in mind. So a data set now internally has this distinction. It has one part in Git and one part uh, that is git annex. Uh, and um, the only overlap uh, between git and git annex is this last um, bullet point right here that explains how version control of, of those large files works. And that is uh, with something that's called file, ident uh, file identity information. And we're going to take a look uh, into, into how this um, how this is, is done internally. Uh, the um, thing that we're going to look at tomorrow uh, is how to actually then make sure that the files that you annex in your data set uh, can be retrieved using data let get. Underneath the hood, this works by um, publishing them to any kind of service of your choice, Google Drive, um, the Open Science Framework, anything. Uh, and Git Annex will then make sure to retrieve them from there. Uh, and that is the reason why you can have very lean data sets that live on Git repository hosting services that are cloned really fast, just as a normal Git repository and not bloat your repository which, with those large files that would render it unusable or really slow um, to work with. And we try to support as many uh, services as uh, we can, and there are lots of services that we're currently working on. If there's uh, anything that you want to be C supported, then just let us know. Um, and as a final uh, piece of information on uh, how to how to actually act on this information uh, about this distinction between Git and Git Annex, the question of uh, yeah, uh, and how do I like what do I do with this? piece of information, like how do I know what things to annex? How can I change the defaults in which things are annexed? So you as a user have the opportunity to configure data sets in the way that you want. And these configurations influence whether files are annexed or not. Um, it's really a case by case consideration, uh, but there are a couple of things um, that I can point you to in order to make these decisions and to implement these decisions. One thing that you have already used when we run the data let create command is what is called run procedure. Those are pre-made configurations that can be, for example, used during create to apply configurations that influence the version control uh, tool decisions. So the text to git um, procedure that was used is a procedure that will make sure that any text file in your data set, regardless of where it is placed, will be version controlled in Git and any non-text file will be version controlled in the annex. That's a very useful uh, configuration for a lot of use cases. You can also write your own procedures. Um, there's a tutorial online if you are interested in that. Um, you can write rules. For example, uh, I want to include every file that is smaller than 20 megabytes in Git and everything that's larger should go into Git Annex. I want to include every file in this directory um, in Git and everything else in Git Annex. I want to include everything in Git is also a perfectly valid uh, configuration. Um, 
it's a pretty extensive rule set that you can that you can make use of. And what you can also do is you can do it on a per command basis. So data let save has this additional parameter to git. And when you've run it, when you data let save stuff, then it will actually put the save uh, modification, the saved file uh, into git instead of git annex, regardless of what the configuration says. So with these configurations in place, uh, data sets basically try to operate um, cleverly, but according to what you tell them so that a data let save uh, puts a file wherever it needs to go, uh, either in Git or in Git Annex, either the default everything is annexed or the co applied configuration, for example, everything in that's text to get everything else to the annex so that you don't need to um, so that you don't need to decide on, on a file by file cases, but you can just data let save and it will do the right thing. <laughs> um, Now to um, add a little bit of multiple choice question about the text to git procedure here. I have a quick question uh, about binary versus text files. Uh, if you uh, open the um, polling tool on your phone or in your browser window, uh, I have a multiple choice question to identify out of uh, all of the files here on the screen, which of them uh, are considered to be text files. That's completely, every, everyone already knows this is, this is really cool. So yes, uh, all of them are text files. If you have the, 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 the opportunity to, to use these kinds of file extensions, definitely go for text files. I can recommend it uh, in all kinds, like on a general research data management perspective, text files um, are the file format that you should try to, to adhere to. Uh, I have a different uh, question, uh, and that is identifying text files in this next set of um, file names based on their extensions. And it also looks like everyone already knows, knows the answer here. Uh, so yeah. Um, it might be counterintuitive to some people that um, think that uh, word files, docx files are, are text files because you write text in it, but they are actually not text files, uh, but binary files. So whenever you have a, a docx file, a PowerPoint presentation, an Excel spreadsheet, those are files that Git cannot cannot work with well. So you might think those are text files, but you shouldn't you shouldn't really store them. Uh, in Git if you have the choice. Uh, the text to Git procedure will make sure that all of the files that you previously saw and identified as text files would be saved in Git. But all of these files here, which are all binary files, they um, would be annexed. And the um, RDM course actually has a complete session on identifying file types and the differences and also different file formats. Uh, so if you want to um, read up on that a little bit more, then you can you can head over there uh, and read it after the workshop um, in case that's interesting to you. Um, one thing that is useful to, uh, and I've already hinted at this, but I really want to drive the point home, uh, but one thing that is useful in, in this um, artifact of how the version control tools here work is that they give the opportunity for kind of disk sp space aware workflows. So you can clone input data that can be however large it, it may be. You have the opportunity to check out all of the files that are included in this input data without wasting any disk space. Um, because in most cases, a public data set that you are using will not um, it will include files that you will not need. It will include modalities that you will not need. So downloading a big chunk of data usually wastes more disk space than uh, is actually necessary. And then whatever contents um, you may need for an analysis for exploration, you can retrieve them on, command, uh, on demand. And whenever you don't need them anymore, you drop them again. Uh, and that uh, is 
a very disk space aware way of um, being considerate to your computer, to your hard drive, to your uh, high performance computing center, and so forth. So the way that um, the get command, um, or the reason why the get command is able to retrieve your files is also an internal detail of how um, the Git Annex version control tool works. Uh, Git Annex is a really fantastic and incredibly clever tool that is capable of keeping a decentralized dis distributed network of file content availability in sync across a complete uh, network of datasets. Um, when you give a file to Git Annex, then uh, this um, file will have an internal location information attached to it. Um, this file availability information can be shown if you were to, for example, run git annex where is on the file. So um, because we included provenance file availability information in the second JPEG, the chinstrap underscore 02 file, uh, you could actually go to the Jupyter Hub and run this to verify this um, output for yourself. Um, what this output shows you is the internal location information on all of the places where file content can be retrieved from. And if you have a file locally available, you will have this little thing here that's called here that will indicate I have the file contents of this file right here. Uh, and then any other location information, and there can be any amount, you can have 15 redundant um, places from where to obtain file contents from, they are also listed here. And when there is a get command, issued, then um, Git Annex will take a look at each of those available locations and it will try to, to retrieve the file from the one which is most convenient. Um, in case you have a file that is only known in a single location, so let's say you created a new result on your, um, in your analysis, but it's nowhere, nowhere else available from. Or the um, chinstrap one um, JPEG that would be available from uh, web sources, but Git Annex doesn't know about them because we haven't told him the, uh, it about it. Then you will not be able to drop this file. Um, it, the version control tools, the one thing or the first thing that they um, will, will desperately try to do is to avoid data loss for you. So if you were to um, save disk space by dropping file contents, it will not work for all files. It will by default only work for files where the version control tools can be sure that you know, they can actually, actually reobtain these contents for you. Uh, and um, you can also try this out uh, now, but we'll do it together later. Uh, um, and that's, that's one of the features uh, of the version control tools and, and how they internally work. And if you have um, a file such as the chinstrap01 image, where there in principle is a remote source available from, then you can also tell your version control tools about it. So if you ha have, uh, have any data that is available also from different sources, then you can also register these different locations uh, with your version control tools. They will make sure that it's actually available from there. That's the exact identical content. And then you would be able to, to drop those files. Um, we have written a publication about this concept because we think it's a really um, resilient way of storing data. It's much more convenient and resilient than those data silo solutions. Um, if you want to, you can read about this in this publication here. Um, but now for a different um, feature of um, uh, data integrity and data safety, and that's the right protection that I hinted at. Um, so the reason why Annex contents, so any file that is stored in the Annex is right protected uh, is that uh, or is buried in the way that Git Annex version controls files. So I'm quickly going to, to show you how that looks like. Um, whenever you 
use git annex or datalet on a file system that allows it, it will create simlinks. Simlinks um, is similar to the Windows concept of a shortcut, where you basically have a reference that let's say lies on your desktop, but it actually points to a different place on your computer system. Um, what git annex does, and you can see this if you run um, the list command with a dish l flag on any annexed file, such as the, um, the, the one JPEG here, you will see that it looks like this is a you know, normal file under the path that you saved it to. But this little arrow here, arrow here indicates that internally it is a simlink that points into this hidden .git directory and in there into this directory annex objects. And this is the internal space where git annex manages your version controlled files. Um, this has a number of advantages. Uh, for one, if you would have a um, repository, a data set, where there are uh, several copies of one and the same file, you actually would only have to store it once. So you would, if you have 100 files, one gigabyte, but they're all identical for whatever reason, the total um, storage space your data set would, would need to take up is one gigabyte instead of 100. Um, that's, that's an advantage of using the Simlink solution. What this Simlink hints at is the internal mechanism with which version control for large files works and why um, there is a certain privacy encoded um, in it. Uh, this um, Zimling looks incredibly unreadable, but one of its main components um, is an identity hash, a file identity hash. A file identity hash is an encoding of the binary identity of the contents of this file in a character string. Um, there are lots of um, algorithms available to do this. The one that we use that we're using is MD5. Uh, it's not the most secure algorithm. You can also configure um, uh, better SHA-1, for example, if you want to. Um, in any case, it's an algorithm that transforms the file contents into a character string. And based on that character string, the identity of the file can be verified. Two files with different identity will have different SHA sums or different MD5 sums, whatever algorithm it is you're using. And if you have the contents of a file, you can MD5 sum it to get its SHA sum to verify that content is indeed identical. But if you only have the SHA sum, then you cannot reverse engineer this, um, this, this, this hash to give you an idea about the content. So if you were to put a private file into a repository, uh, then the only file content indication that would be that would be available to, to any unauthorized person that gets a copy of it would be this, um, this, this identity hash that they uh, can, cannot really infer file contents from. Uh, what Git Annex then does is it tells Git about the content hash. So what it actually version controls in Git is the sim link here that points with a content identifier to the actual internally managed file content. And if you do any modification to the file content that is versioned here, then uh, the identity hash changes. This is a modification due to the um, version control of the sim link in Git that Git will notice so a version controlled annexed file that is uh, modified will be visible um, as a modification uh, in Git. And that does the splits between version controlling stuff with the most uh, powerful version control tool that we have, Git, without checking their contents into Git, but still keeping an identity record um, in the version control history so that version control based on file identity is possible. Uh, and the reason for um, write protection of these file contents is that if you were to um, force overwrite the contents of a version controlled file um, without, without Git Annex having a say in this, the file identity hash of this version controlled file um, would change 
and the zim link would point into a different place to a different hash, but git annex will not have had the opportunity to record to record this additional version of your file into the history. So what git annex does, it write protects those files and only lets you modify them um, when you actually told git annex that you have an annexed file that you want to make a modification to. So this is one thing that you should remember with the same um, at, at the same place where you start the information on do not remove .git or the data let or .git attribute files from your data set. The other information that goes in the very same direction is do not force overwrite um, any, um, any files in your data set. Uh, instead, um, tell, tell the tools about it. And we're going to um, take a look at how that works. And this is operation telling the version control tools about you willing to, to modify a file that's called unlocking. Uh, and in order to, to, get, to get to this, we're going to continue a little bit in the, um, in the module here. Uh, if you scroll down to data processing, this will take you uh, with a little bit of a detour and a teaser into reproducible processing to the topic of unlocking things. Um, and just to give a quick motivation, because this is the next little teaser into recording um, computational provenance of what was done, um, you might have had the uh, unfortunate situation that you needed to reuse or re-understand a uh, thing that you have done in the past, a script, a program, anything, but you didn't leave a proper record of how it was actually to be executed. And it's not really clear how to use it. It's not really clear what results came out of it. Um, and uh, the commands that we're going to introduce in passing with the next few steps here, they are going to show you a way out of this, this dilemma here. Um, quickly going to post this into the chat again. So in order to, um, to continue here in this narrative, uh, we have a super useful data analysis or uh, data modification exercise. Uh, we actually do some image processing in the sense that we are attempting to do the incredibly novel and important scientific breakthrough of converting images of penguins to black and white. And for this, um, we're going to structure the data set a little bit in this kind of uh, toy example um, uh, data uh, analysis uh, fashion. We're going to create a, a directory code for a script uh, and um, we are going to create an outputs directory where we are going to save all the black and white penguins. And, um, I'm going to, whoops, that, that was the wrong one. I'm going to uh, quickly um, do this and you're invited to follow along. So you can see that the data set now has a code directory and an outputs directory. And we've prepared a little script. Feel free to actually download that and save it with a data download URL if you if you want to practice here, the code that's included is just a wget that contains the script and then saves it. Uh, so now we have a little piece of code that uh, we'll be able to, to transform images from color to black and white. Um, you can um, take a look into the script. You can also, um, run it with the dash dash help option to get some insights on how it is to be used, but the identity, the contents of the script are really not that important. Uh, important is um, what we're going to do uh, in, 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 in the following few commands. So under normal circumstances, when you have written software, when you have written a script um, and you are applying the script to your data, then what you typically do is you take the, the interpreter, um, whichever, whichever software that may be, 
here it is Python, it might be R, it might be MATLAB, it might be COBOL, <laughs> anything, Fortran, C. Uh, you um, specify this, you can also put it into a shebang and make it executable, whatever you want. But this, this really basic script is to be run by calling this interpreter Python and then uh, using specifying the script it should run on the uh, input image and the output image. And uh, that is done here in Python, but um, works with works similarly with, with any kind of um, software that, that you are using in your day-to-day -day work. Um, so if I'm if I'm running this, then I will have created a new um, output. It's right here. If I run data let status now, because nothing um, in these directories is yet um, saved, this will this, this will be showing the the top level outputs directory. Um, but we have this uh, beautiful black and white conversion of penguins. Um, that that's a breakthrough. Um, now that's untracked. So in order to you know version control it, we still need to run this data let's save command. Super annoying. Uh, so much to do. Um, oh God, so many individual commands to run. So let's explore a way in which this um, is a little bit easier and also has a little bit more provenance capture. And the, the command that we're using for this um, is called data let run. Data let run is essentially a wrapper. It um, takes any kind of thing that you can put into a command line call, like this Python invocation, um, and it will execute whatever you give to it, but also make a note of any changes that um, that uh, it, it will make a note of any changes that have occurred as a consequence of running this. Um, I will before I demonstrate this, I will quickly make sure that I have a clean dataset state. That's good. That's good practice. Uh, and um, now let me demonstrate how to do a data let run command. It starts with the main data let command followed by the subcommand run. You can see that I'm giving it um, this optional but informative commit message. Uh, and then you can see that it includes the very same um, command, in command line invocation that I have done before for the second penguin image. Now, if I run this, it will execute it, um, but it will have not only um, saved this automatically. Uh, so if I run data net status now, that will be all clean or saved, but it will also have created a kind of weird looking record. So if I run git show, to show you the contents of the most recent commit in my commit history, uh, you can see something that hasn't been a part of previous commit messages. It looks weird, but it is a structured machine readable record that essentially um, encodes what has been done in these do not change lines below, do not change lines above um, um, yeah, warnings. Uh, and what um, data that can do with such a record is uh, inspected and automatically re-executed. It's useful mostly for machines, but it also has this human readable component where you can at least infer what has been done. So if you were to find this data set somewhere on the web and clone it, and then um, you really want to know how they were able to create black and white images of penguins, then you can also just ask um, the file, uh, how it came to be by just saying, okay, give me the commit entry that is associated um, with this specific file. And it will say, uh, this person has created it uh, at this point in time, but not only that, it will also show you um, which command uh, was run in order to, to perform this action. 
Um, we're going to try this out later, but what you can do with uh, this commit as well is to take the commit identifier, just as we have done in, for example, git reward, and use it to re-execute um, this uh, command. But uh, now to quickly um, go from this reproducible execution detour back to the data protection, let's do something that uh, will show you in what way files are write protected. Um, the JPEGs in this data set are binary files. And because we configured the data set with text to Git, um, they are annexed and under annex version control. So modifying a file that is already saved will create a situation in which the version control tool will go and protect it. So if I go and take this Python snippet here and run it to apply the very same script to the very same file in an attempt to modify it, then what will happen is that the tool that you're going to use to do the modification will buff. It depends a bit on the tool how badly it will buff. Um, some tools really just say, hey, it's a permission denied error. Um, some tools might give you 10, 20 lines of internal errors until they actually tell you, okay, it's a permission denied error. So keep, keep this kind of thing in mind when you work with annexed files that you want to modify. Um, that a potential and very likely um, issue with modifying these files is that they're actually um, right protected. Um, these permission denied errors, they stem from git annex that prevents any sort of modification, any attempt at modifying this file. And the way to circumvent this uh, is um, a little bit further down in this, um, in this uh, code overview, uh, and that is called data led unlock. I'm quickly going to run this, and you can run this too, and then um, take a look at what has actually changed by running data led unlock. Unlock by, um, for example, um, running data led status um, that shows a modification, uh, or git status that will um, show the modification with a little bit more defaults. Um, what you can see uh, is uh, what Git refers to as a type change. Um, and data led refers to as a modification. Uh, but what has happened underneath the hood is shown here on these slides. And that um, is true on file systems that support symlinks. Um, when you unlock a file to make it writable, what happens underneath the hood is that the symlink is resolved so that there's not a pointer into any internal structure uh, where your file is, is internally versioned, but the file is actually transferred back into the original um, location for uh, the duration of this unlocking period so that it becomes modifiable without uh, breaking the symlink that is associated with it. So instead of having the error um, that points to some weird directory with the file identity hash, you actually have just a pointer to the file um, that uh, has been, has been um, unlocked. And when you try to rerun the Python modification or the Python script that would perform a modification on an unlocked file, then this operation will succeed. Uh, there will still be this um, type change and now in addition, uh, a modification. Uh, but what you can do in order to lock the file again and save the modification, uh, let me quickly um, just um, save this, uh, copy this, is um, oops running data, let's save, and that would in principle save the modification, lock the file again, and everything, everything would, be, would be neatly version controlled now. So that's, that's one way <laughs> of handling this. And it was one way of me showing you the concrete consequences of um, version controlling large files 
uh, of Heinz Bitget Annex, but it was a very inconvenient thing to need to unlock and modify and save all of these things. It's definitely one way to do it. Um, so you know about it. Uh, and um, most of the files that uh, you might encounter in, in, in data sets that you will work with in the future, they actually annex files that do not that frequently change. So for example, raw data or pre-processed data, all of that is stuff that you might not actually want to change. So this unlock command is not really something that you will encounter frequently in the wild or during your during your own data-led endeavors, but it's the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, way to to um, yeah revoke or to to make to make these files files modifiable and writable. What is uh, more convenient than doing the unlock and save dance, though, uh, is to actually let um, data led run take care of it. Uh, this um, is a command that not only does the provenance capture that I've already hinted at, but it also has um, flags that can ensure a couple of additional things. For one has a flag that's called input. Um, that is a flag that will ensure that any files that you um, put there as options or as, as, as paths will be retrieved from uh, wherever they, their content might be stored using data let get, so that if you run an analysis and you share it with a collaborator and they are to rerun your um, previous analysis using data let rerun, they automatically make sure that the input is retrieved as well uh, and they don't have to perform a manual data let get. The other flag that data let run has is the output flag and output is a useful flag to include in data led run commands because that is a flag that performs the unlocking in case there's a modification that needs to take place. It's a very careful command. So I usually use it very liberally. Any directory in the file that you specify as output will be unlocked just to make sure that it is modifiable um, in case uh, there is a modification made to it. Uh, and then um, the data let's save that happens at the end of the run uh, will make sure to lock it again. So in order to make this a little bit less messy, um, instead of unlocking and saving, uh, we can just craft a data let run command that is a little bit more um, structured, a little bit more, a little bit longer, uh, and it includes a specification of the input image and a specification of the output image that need, may need to be unlocked in order to apply any modification that the Python script could do to it. Um, what you can also see uh, is a little convenient shortcut here because we already included this path specification in the input and this path specification in the output. We're too lazy to write it again into the invocation of the script so we can say, Oh man, just give me the inputs and here give me the outputs. And that will not only create this, um, this analysis that we wanted to do in a provenance tracked manner, it also made the just well the gory details of having write protected stuff in a version controlled in a version control system um, less visible um, and and easier to deal with. So as a uh, quick task for you to try out, applying the knowledge about commit hairs and IDs, um, you can try to actually uh, take this most recent run commit from the history and plug it into a data led rerun command. Uh, and uh, then if you're up to it, uh, report how you did it, what, what kind of strategy you did, and also uh, what happened to your dataset history uh, when you performed um, the rerun. And if anyone succeeded then and, and is willing to speak up, then 
you can just raise your hand <laughs> or, or speak up and or share your screen if you want to. Did anyone, did anyone who tried it have problems with um, doing data library run? If not, I'm just quickly going to show you how it can be done. Uh, so you could take a look into the commit history and take the first few characters from your commit hash, but because it's the most recent commit, you can also just say data library run and it will rerun or it will identify the most recent commit automatically uh, and reapply the Python script. Now, what ha has happened internally um, only becomes visible when we take a look into the commit history. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that uh, there's only a single uh, command that's prefix with, prefixed with this data led run command, even though there was the first data led run that we executed and then this rerun. Um, importantly, um, data led rerun will only make a new commit or to phrase it a little bit better, is only able to make a new commit when the outcome of its computation changes uh, anything in the data set. If I'm rerunning a script and I'm receiving bit identical results, then there will not be a different or new commit in your dataset history. And that's a very useful indication uh, of any script that you are running on your data, any analysis, um, actually producing bit identical results. So if that's a use case that um, you are interested in evaluating whether or not your analysis is deterministic enough to compute um, computationally reproducible stuff, then that's also something that you can use this quick indication for. So um, to give you a little bit of a summary about this, these details of how the version control tools work underneath the hood, um, files in your dataset are either kept in Git or Git Annex, and data let save is used for both of these files. But you can uh, ensure with configurations or with rules or with flags um, that only those files go into the annex that you actually want to be annexed, or only those files go to Git that you actually want to see in Git. That's a consideration that you have to do based on your personal needs, and I hope I've given you a little bit of context on which um, version control tool might be the most suitable one. Um, annexed files behave differently from those kept in Git. They can be retrieved and dropped on demand, which is cool for disk space aware workflows, um, they are write protected, which is not so cool if you um, really want to modify things frequently. Um, and their content is unknown to Git, which can be cool to keep things private, but it's not so cool if you want something that, for example, can be downloaded from GitHub directly. Um, when you data let clone a URL or a path, then you can install the data set that's available under this path or URL. Um, but any annexed file contents are only available after you explicitly retrieve them with GET and can be dropped on demand uh, as well. Anything that's stored in GET is available to you, including their contents right away. In case you want to make annexed files modifiable, there's a data let unlock command. Um, and data let's save locks those files again, but it's generally easier um, to um, use the data let run command. And in case you're now a little bit worried that you might accidentally annex files accidentally or um, put files accidentally in Git, there are means to redo this or undo this for both types of files, but it's generally much easier 
to un-annex files, so to get them out of the annex and put them back to Git in case you want things in Git. It's harder to do it for files kept in Git. Um, both um, ways are detailed in, in the data lit handbook. There's a complete um, walkthrough to all, through all kinds of file operations that you can do. Um, then there's data let run. It was only a preview, but it's a useful command to record the impact that any command has on a data set. Um, and when you provide input and output, then you can make sure that any uh, necessary data is retrieved and any uh, to be modified output is unlocked so that this command um, works well and also reproducible and uh, helps your collaborators and your future self to figure out what has been done. And then rerun can automatically re-execute those run records uh, later. Um, so here's a tiny multiple choice question. Um, while I wait for any questions on the content uh, of this of this session. I know it's a very unsexy topic, but it's the one, it's the one um, topic where most confusion arises. And knowing knowing these details is as boring and as technical as they may seem. Um, this is the thing that will actually get you very far in understanding and and and, and planning all kinds of use cases that you may want um, to use. Uh, data led for. And uh, I see that everyone is already uh, excelling in the multiple choice questions.